Okay, well, let's dive in. Uh, when you arrived, you got a half sheet. Um, let's see here if this is working. Yes, but I'd like to take um, about 25 minutes or so and just launch into some teaching today. I call God's favorite kind of worship, God's favorite kind of worship. And I want to start off with this. When you were growing up, think way back to when you were growing up. Some of you are still growing up. But for those who that maybe was like myself a, a while ago, I want you to think of what was your favorite sports team that you were cheering for? What was your favorite ice cream? What was your favorite band or artist? Who's got one for me? Who can remember? Daniel, what do you got? Do you have a favorite sports team growing up? Who were you cheering for? I uh, wasn't really cheering for anybody, but I mean, Terrell Davis was my babysitter, but that was about it. Okay, okay. Did you have a favorite, did you have a favorite band growing up? Um, I like Metallica. Metallica, okay. Grew up on Metallica, you liked it loud. Someone else, favorite band, favorite? Patriots. Patriots, cheering for the Patriots, yep. Cowboys. Cowboys, okay. What else were some of your favorites? Anybody have a favorite ice cream growing up? Whatever happened to butterscotch ripple? Was that a thing in America? I don't even know if that exists anymore. Some others. Some others. Some favorites growing up. What were some of your favorites? Laura, what were some of your favorites? I'm picking on y'all now. Uh, I love Carrie Underwood. Carrie Underwood. Let's go. And cookies and cream. Cook, you can't. Hey, have you ever had Cookie Two Step by the Bluebell? Oh, change your life, man. Change your life. So I had favorite music growing up, and when I grew up, um, music was on these big black discs that we called records. Does anybody recognize this album cover? If I show this album cover to you, do you recognize this cover? Okay, hands up if you recognize it. Hands up if you recognize it. Okay, David keeps repeating himself. So this is one of my favorite albums growing up. Does anybody recognize this album cover? Not as well known by this group. This is Paul Simon Graceland. And these were, two, uh, these were two records that I can remember my dad, I remember my dad brought these home and I remember my dad would play them. And we had this thing, me and my sister would, would go into uh, the spare room and my dad would crank up the turntable and we would like jump on the bed. And we just, we just had fun, we enjoyed music. And it was some of our favorite music to listen to. Do you know that God has some favorite things as well? And one of those favorite things is worship. And just like we have strong opinions, like I heard you guys shout out, you know, Patriots, strawberry ice cream, whatever your favorite thing was, God has some opinions and some things that he wants to know about the kind of worship that he's looking for. So if we're going to lead God's people every single week in true worship, we need to have clarity. Everyone say clarity. Clarity. We need to have clarity on the kind of worship that we should be chasing after so that God receives what He desires so that we can intentionally and accurately teach others what true worship is. So let's hear what God has to say about it. I want to encourage you to turn to your Bibles to John chapter 4. Maybe you have your Bible on your phone. But go to the Gospel of John and turn to chapter 4. And I want to teach today just on two verses, John 4, verse 23 and 24. And as you turn there, I want you to know that this is the most concentrated teaching on worship in the whole of the New Testament. This is the pinnacle moment. This is one of the few times that Jesus Christ himself taught on worship. And just going into the background of the story, you might remember that John 4 is where Jesus meets the woman at the well. And what Jesus is doing, just to give you the context of this chapter, is he's undermining the way the Jewish people had worshipped up until this point. Up until this point, it had been about ritualism and going to a place and offering sacrifice. And in just a few short words, Jesus Christ undermines and displaces worship out of the temple of man and into the temple of our individual hearts. So I want us to see what the text says. Verse 23, it says this. I'm reading from the NIV. Yet a time is coming and has now come. Everyone say now. now. Has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. God has a strong and specific opinion on how he is to be worshipped. Did you know that? And my desire today is that as we learn from God's word is that he will put inside of us a passion to align us and to align our worship to what he has commanded and prescribed in his word. So let's pray this morning as we learn from God's word. Lord Jesus, there is no way to measure what you are worth. Lord, there's not a number high enough to count the reasons why we should worship you. And I pray, Father, in the next few moments, God, that you would illuminate our hearts and dial in our ears, Lord, to hear not from me, but from you and your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would teach us and that you would teach this ministry what it means to worship you in spirit and truth, that you would be honored and that you would be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is the big idea today. Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we are according to everything that he is. Can we say that together? Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we are according to everything he is. I want to encourage you to follow along on your sermon notes that you got there. And here's the first thing. God's favorite kind of worship is very specific. God's favorite kind of worship is very specific specific. Did you know that God's favorite worship isn't about style, but it's about substance? The substance of the kind of worship God is looking for is described by two words in the Bible, spirit and truth. And we're going to unpack what those words mean in a few moments. But in a sentence, spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we have according to everything he is. But if you notice, look in the text, look at John 23 and 24. There is no mention of musical style. There's no instrument list. There's no check out the latest Phil Wickham album and do what he's doing. There's nothing about music in these two passages, yet it's the most concentrated teaching on worship in the whole of the New Testament. Yet there's no mention of music. God's favorite kind of worship, the kind that he's looking for, is not dependent on a tight band. It's not dependent on slick vocals. But those are merely tools to draw us into worship. But make no mistake about it. I'm going to say something radical here, and you've got to stay with me. Music itself, the chords, the notes, the lyrics, by God's own definition, music itself is not worship. Music itself is not worship. Now let me qualify that before some of you send Pastor Grant an email. <laughs> Music can be offered as worship. Everyone say can. Music can be offered as worship, and the Bible teaches that God loves that and receives music as worship, but only when it's offered from a heart with substance, in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we are, according to everything he is. I will often remind my staff, I tell them pretty much every week, the greatest worship leading that you will ever do is not off stage with a hand, pardon me, is not on stage with a hand on an instrument, but off stage with a hand on a shoulder. Let me say that again. The greatest, and it's true for everyone in this room, the greatest worship leading that you will ever do is not on stage with a hand on an instrument, but off stage with a hand on a shoulder. You know, there's a lot of arguments and disagreements over worship style, and they're often used by the devil to divide the body over a secondary issue. But they're also used by the devil into deceiving us that worship is about us and our musical preferences. Maybe you've been a part of a worship ministry or a church, or maybe you've been, like myself, guilty of that in the past. True worship is not about our musical preferences. There's nothing in this passage about musical style. Nothing about hymns, nothing about choruses. It's not about style, it's about substance. 
So the most important question that we can ask when we plan and execute worship is not, what does the congregation want? That song seems to be working well. Let's do that one again. Or what does the band know? What does the band want? They love playing that song. The most important question when you plan worship is what does God want? And what would honor Him? And what would bring Him glory? And that's a question that we try to let drive our times of planning every week, every Tuesday when we plan. God, how would you like to be worshipped today? Worship is for Jesus Christ, not for ourselves. So we can ask the question, Jesus, how do you want to be worshipped? God doesn't want to leave us in the dark on this. He gives a crystal clear answer in his word and on the specific way he desires to be worshipped. Jesus, how do you want to be worshipped? Well, let's look at the, at the text. It says in verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So here's the second thing. God's favorite kind of worship is very distinctive. Very distinctive. God is seeking true worshipers. Look at the text again. Look at verse 23. Let's read that one more time. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. There's different kinds of worshipers. And God is seeking for a specific kind. Now let's just start with this premise. If our Lord and Savior is looking, is seeking for anything... Do you not want to know what he's looking for so that you can adjust and become the very thing that he's looking for? Isn't that an incredible thought that God is looking for something? I want to know how I can become more like the thing that God is seeking for. Are you actively looking and seeking to become the type of worshiper that God is looking for? There's different kinds of worships, worshipers. Do you see it in the text? For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So here's the thing. If there's such thing as true worshipers, it necessitates that there also must be such thing as what? False worshipers. So false worshipers exist. And false worship exists. Now in the Old Testament, it's called idolatry. And really an idol, it can be anything. It can be anything that displaces God and becomes the object of our affections. And although we don't bow down to stone images or statues or idols maybe like they did centuries ago, we have other idols in uh, 21st century North American culture. And I thought of a couple here. Maybe you resonate with these. Time. Time. We're in a hurry. Got to be on time. I don't have time. Somebody tell me the time. We're all kind of consumed and governed by the almighty clock. Uh, here's another thing. Um, what about sports? What about sports? We regularly pour out our highest praise at the altar of organized sports. Some of us know our team's stats better than we know the Bible. Others of us get more excited when their sports team is winning than they are themselves getting excited about being on the winning team. How about education and knowledge? Well, I'm so-and-so, and look at my titles, and look what I know, and blah, 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 blah. How about food? How about security and entitlement? There's different altars in the 21st century that we bow down and we worship. But we don't want to be concerned with those. We want to be true worshipers. So here's the third thing. God's favorite kind of worship is very urgent. It is very urgent. Do you know that God doesn't give a lot of suggestions in the Bible, but he does make some clear commands. And as the author, uh, John, gets to the heart of what true worship is, he makes certain the narrow urgency in the text by using the word must. Okay? Let's look at the text again together. Verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now. The time is now. Can you feel the urgency in the text? Yet is now come when the Father... Pardon me, come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his, sir, and his worshipers must, everyone say must, must, must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, this is the way God commit. Well, I figured out another way and I'm going to, no, this is the way. God is very clear 
on the way that he wants to be worshipped. It's not open for interpretation. This is what the Word of God says. It is the way, the only way, spirit and truth. How we are to worship God is not left open for interpretation. On the contrary, John captures this compelling call for us to worship in a specific way without deviation. If we are truly his worshipers, God is spirit and his worshipers must, if we're truly his worshipers, the text states that the worship we must offer will be immediately characterized by two things, spirit and truth. Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we have according to everything he is. So let's get down into the nitty gritty of it. Here's the fourth thing. God's favorite kind of worship is spirit worship. Is spirit worship. Now the Greek word used for spirit in the text is pneuma. Can everyone say pneuma? Pneuma. And notice in the text, look in the Bible, the word spirit in verse 24 is that a small S or a big S? It's a small S. If it's a big S in your translation, it is a wrong. It is a small S. Small S. Because it's not talking about the Holy Spirit, but rather the human spirit. The part of you that governs your emotions, your desires, your affections. Now listen, contextually in this passage, this is a big deal. In one simple statement. Jesus Christ blows apart the dead orthodoxy and ritual practice of showing up to the temple and worshiping God with sacrifice, and he says something radical. He says, The God no longer dwells in temples made by men, but now dwells in the temple of our hearts. This is important. We take Jesus Christ, we take his spirit everywhere we go. He now dwells with inside of us. It is a change in geography. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, this is huge. Huge. Big change in geography. God's favorite kind of worship isn't about faithfully showing up to a building on Sunday and making some mental ascent that's in agreement to lyrics on the screen. It's not about allowing the worship team to represent your feelings and do the spirit part for you. I sometimes think that even in the 21st century culture that nothing has really changed. Because if you remember in the Old Testament, the Levites were responsible for offering their worship up on the people. All the people weren't priests offering sacrifices. It was the Levites doing them and they were the worship leaders of their time. In the New Testament it says that we are all priests. But do you know something? We still have people showing up to church and their mouths are shut and their faces are droopy and their arms are to their side and they're not engaged at all, but they love Jesus. And they need to grow in understanding what spirit is. And sometimes those people, God bless them, they think, well, they're doing it for me. And sometimes that makes me think, have we really ever changed since the Old Testament? It's that same idea, right? That people are, the worship team is going to do the work for us. They're going to be the ones. And if I agree with it in my heart, I'm good with the Lord. But there's no way that you can read this book front to back and to think that the Lord is not asking, not just the worship team, but everyone that calls themselves a Christ follower to be engaged. It's not about allowing the worship team to represent your feelings and do the spirit part for you. It's marked by engagement and participation and presence. Okay, so here's the hard word. Introverts, you don't get a free pass. And I'm going to put Melissa on the spot. I work with Melissa daily. I just want to tell you, Melissa's an introvert. Melissa is as introverted as they come. Am I telling the truth? Do we have a more spirit-driven worship leader? And that's not to put down any of our other worship leaders, but she leads the way here at Hampton and she is fully engaged and fully participatory. So that tells me something. If an introvert like Melissa can dial it up, it's within you. It's within you. Now you say, Travis, easy for you to say. You're the most outgoing extrovert I've ever met. True. <laughs> it might come easier to me. I may not need to go and sleep for six hours after Sunday morning. <laughs> But introverts, you don't get a pass. God's favorite worship isn't about ritual, but it's about lifestyle. And the worship God is looking for emanates from our inner spirit. It can't be phoned in or done by others on your behalf. 24-7 lifestyle. Worship is a verb. It's an ongoing action. 
Do you know that there are no sidelines in the courts of our king? In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, if you, if you research how people worshipped in, in the temple and in the tabernacle, there's never a viewing gallery. Everybody is doing something. Everybody who had a role is engaged in participating. And that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the bullseye that we are going for, that we are shooting for as a church. Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we have according to everything he is. Spirit worship demands, demands something of us. Maybe you've never thought of worship that way. It demands everything that we have. So within the temperament God has given you, you say, well, Travis, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not going to look like you on Sunday. Great. You should never look like me. You should look like you. But you should look like the fully dialed up version of you. And what that means is don't let me catch you at a baseball game Saturday night and you're hooting and hollering and cheering and jumping up and down. And then I come and catch you Sunday morning and you're just like biding your time. If that's the case, then maybe there's some growing we need to do in what it means to be spirit-led worship and to worship God with our spirits. If we're liable to show more spirit in a sports game than we are in church, then we do have some growing to do. Spirit worship is the intentional involvement of all our attention, our affections, and our capacities turned towards Jesus Christ in praise and honor and adoration. Spirit worship leaves everything on the field. What a privilege, guys. What a privilege it is every week that we have been called to exhaust ourselves for Jesus Christ every Sunday. What an honor that we would be depleted for God, not by strenuous labor, but by sacrificial love. Pouring out the totality of who we are to Him who is so deserving. We get to do that. How awesome is that? Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we have, according to everything He is. Here's the last thing. God's favorite kind of worship is truth worship. God's favorite kind of worship is truth worship. Worshiping in spirit alone is not enough. The text says that God is looking for true worshipers and He defines them as those who are worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Not only must we avoid the shoulders up worship of dead orthodoxy, but we also must avoid the emotionalism of zealous worship without an anchor. What does an anchor do? Hold something in place, right? But what else does it do? If the waters are moving back and forth, what does an anchor pre prevent? Drifting. From drifting. If you want to understand how bad doctrine gets into a church, it all starts with a drift. If you're wondering why some of the mainline denominations are now allowing things that when you read your Bible, you thought were not permitted by God's word, it's because 50 years ago, they started to drift. They lost their anchor. Truth is an anchor. But catch this, even if we're sincere in our worship, if our worship lacks truth, it's not true worship. That's a hard thing to receive. So consider this, you can be sincere and still be severely wrong. God's not giving out free passes to those who are worshiping false gods. There's a lot of people in the world that worship false gods and they do it very sincerely. You probably know them. You say, well, they're worshiping and they're in this cult. Maybe they're worshiping something else like their family, very sincerely. Well, God, I love my family with all my heart, my soul, and my strength. You did, but you never put your trust in Jesus Christ. You never worshiped me in spirit and truth. You can sincerely worship something, yet still be se severely wrong. And it's a sobering thought to think that it's possible to be 100% sincere in our worship, to be fully engaged, but for us to be divorced from truth and therefore missing the mark of what God's looking for. So the Greek word for truth in this passage is aletheia. And it means this. It means what is object, pardon me, objectively and absolutely true in any matter at any time. 
These are the things that are always consistently true. So truth worship is concerned with everything God is. His nature, his attributes, all the things that are true about him. In theology, the study of this, if we summarize it all together, we call it doctrine. So one of the questions we are always asking when we write songs for the church is, is this lyric biblically true? Listen, if you want to start a fire in your church, put the word of God in people's mouths and have them sing it back to God. There's nothing more that he loves. Nothing more. And that's why we're just not like sitting around during the week saying, oh, what's the latest Phil Wickham? I keep p- picking on Phil Wickham, but what's the latest worship song that we should be singing? No, we're looking at the lyric. Is it biblically true? Is it biblically accurate? And even when we're writing, Melissa mentioned it uh, when we were ta- teaching you that new song, Stay. Um, it's right out of God's word, Psalm 27. One thing I ask is one thing I desire, that I may gaze upon the Lord all the days of my life. Truth matters. And the songs we sing on Sunday teach people how to think about God. So often when people are on their deathbeds, they rarely remember the points of a sermon, but they will often remember the lyric of a worship song. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, help me out, what's the next line? My Savior art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. All those hymns that I learned as a child are embedded in my heart because music embeds truth in the souls of men. Every growing worshiper is a growing student of the Bible. Let me say that one more time. Every growing worshiper. If you're a worshiper, if you consider yourself a worshiper, you ought to be growing in your knowledge of the Bible. We cannot worship what we do not know, folks. So an ongoing daily diet of God's Word is essential. Everyone say essential. Essential. It's essential to being able to worship God in truth. A great discipline of any worship life team member is developing clear answers for why a worship lyric is biblically true and where in the scriptures it is sourced. Worthy of it all. I'm just telling you right now. You open, the, you open your Bible between Revelation chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 5, you will find all the lyrics to worthy of it all. Every single... Like, really? So it wasn't... Like, I'm always amazed. Aren't you amazed when you find out that, like, a lyric is, is in the Bible? Do you guys remember the old chorus, Here I Am to Worship? And you know how in the chorus it says, You're altogether lovely. I love that lyric. And I was blown out of my socks when I found that Ver, that, that word in the Song of Solomon. Altogether lovely. I'm like, that is really cool. There's all these little gems. But we ought to know. We ought to know where our songs are sourced from in the word. An infectious melody married to a pleasant lyric with honest sincerity is not enough. It's hard. I recognize it's hard because we all know people who are very sincere. But there are hard things for us to learn from God's Word. Okay? Sincerity isn't enough. It's got to be true. It's got to be true. Sincerity is good, but when it's matched and anchored in truth. That's why this church is committed to singing the Word of God. We have an anchor, and our anchor is the Word of God. And we're not looking to come up with like trite and interesting phrases. Oh, that's cute. Let's sing that. We want to sing the Word of God. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So one of the questions we're asking as we choose songs is what would promote a rich dwelling of God's Word? God's favorite kind of worship is spirit worship. God's favorite kind of worship is truth worship. Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we are according to everything He is. Let's say that one more time together out loud. Come on. Spirit and truth worship is worshiping God with everything we are, according to everything he is. Do you feel like you understand this passage a little bit better today? Praise God. Well, there's some questions on the bottom of that sheet that I would encourage you in your private time with the Lord to wrestle with or to even in the green room, strike up a conversation and just think about what your answers would be. Considering what this passage says, what needs to change or be improved in your journey to becoming a true worshiper? And what's one step that you can take this week 
to better live a lifestyle of spirit and truth worship 